Hello and welcome. I am Designer Dave, a 24-year game industry veteran who has uh, worked on many games you might recognize, Warcraft 3, World of Warcraft, Oddworld Stranger's Wrath, and uh, many others. Today's uh, questions are about games that I've worked on, or just games in general. Question number one. Diablo 4 seems slightly promising to be a more Blizzard game rather than an Activision game. What are your thoughts on it so far? Don't get your hopes up. Diablo 4 might seem like a promising game, but remember that it's in the stages of development where they're concentrating on finding the fun and making a real Diablo game. They haven't hit the monetization stages yet, or at least we've only gotten a glimpse of some of their monetization ideas, and they don't look good. I won't go into details on them <laughs> because I'll save it for a future video when it's released, because there's still a vague possibility that they don't do exactly what they're currently planning, and I hope not. Just keep your expectations lowered, because this is the Activision Blizzard that you know from making Diablo Immortal and stuff like that. It might seem like a more Diablo 4 game, just wait and see. Don't pre-order. Pre-order basically gives them carte blanche to do whatever they want. If you don't pre-order, then they have to make sure that the final product is much better. What's your most favorite game of all time, excluding your own work? It's tough to say. I would say that I put the most hours into Warframe, but it's not my favorite game because primarily I like narrative driven games. I, I would say that my favorite game of all time at the moment is uh, probably Mass Effect 2, which had some of the best writing in it of all time. It did give you that sense that you were guiding Shepard's path through the story, but it was it was smoke and mirrors, but I actually appreciate that sort of craftsmanship because I aspire to it myself. D I intend to do a playthrough of Mass Effect Legendary Edition at some point because I've heard good things about it and there are some interesting mods that I would like to add on. Question number three. Could you share your opinion on the upcoming MMO being developed by Riot? Do you think it will have serious consequences to the active WoW player base? I don't have an opinion because I haven't seen anything. There is the potential for it to be a very good MMORPG, and based on Riot's previous work, I have no reason to believe it wouldn't be a very good version of an MMORPG. My main question is, are they going to try and break the mold of what is an MMORPG? And what I mean by that, there's a formula from World of Warcraft that almost every MMORPG RPG has followed almost to the 80% mark, if not 100%. I want to see an MMORPG that completely breaks that mold, doesn't have like basically linear quests and things like that, does more a better job than even Guild Wars 2 of like open world exploration and inviting people to explore things together and do things together. I think there's a lot of missed opportunities in that design space. If anyone could do it, I think maybe maybe it would be right. But then again, you know, Valorant, it's its, its own thing, but it is kind of a cookie cutter hero based MOBA. Is that what it is? I got to brush up on my terms. We'll see. We'll see what happens. There's nothing to be seen yet, and there's probably not going to be anything to be seen for another decade, if I'm being honest, uh, the way that they release games. Question number four. What sort of tools did you use to design quests in WoW? Do you have your fa any favorite quests? Uh, in WoW, it was all proprietary stuff from Blizzard. There was nothing particularly special about it. In fact, I found the user interface to be, it was garbage. It wasn't well designed. They got the quest designers who were already on the team got, had already gotten used to it though. So it was very hard to get changes from them. And since it was not going to be released to the public, it was determined that there was no point in updating the tools to be more user friendly or have a better user experience because that I mean they weren't going to be released to the public which I think actually might have been a mistake imagine if anyone could design their own WoW quest and then WoW would incorporate certain ones. Another missed opportunity. If we'd spent maybe a month improving the tools, I think that we could have had much greater efficiency in creating the quest lines, but not to be done. Favorite quests, right. I, I have one favorite that I made that unfortunately got nerfed before it was released, and that is the Sergra Darkthorn quest when you first get to the crossroads. I had some subterfuge in there where she would be very cruel and spiteful towards male characters and very uh, warm and uh, encouraging towards female characters. And I just thought that was an interesting dynamic to introduce, that she might be a misandrist. <laughs> and that would get conversations going in the crossroads. So imagine some of those conversations. People are like, oh, Sarah Darkthorn is such a B-word. People playing female characters would be like, what do you mean? She's the nicest character in the game. Alas, it was not meant to be. It was nerfed by Jeff Kaplan. Question number five. Since you helped make Resurrection 4 for the N64, did you help make the maps called Rage and StarCraft Troopers? I couldn't find these on the PC version, but they were so fun. No, I did not help with those. I only worked on my map. I believe 
believe Starcraft Troopers was by Matt Morris, and I'm I'm not even familiar with the one called Rage. I missed must have missed that one. I don't think that they were ported to PC or anything. I think the only version of Resurrection 4 that exists, a user might have hacked the N64 ROM. I don't think that it was ever put out by Blizzard as its own thing. Question number six. During development of Reign of Chaos, The Frozen Throne, what were some of the restrictions you had in making new or requesting new bespoke assets for levels you were building? In the, It depends on at what stage in development. Early on, there weren't too many restrictions, but there was like a art budget. So we couldn't uh, ask for too many things. So we had to be very picky and choosy between the entire level design team about what we would ask to be added to the game. For ROC, we did a lot with very little. <laughs> a lot of the assets were made before we'd even started working on the campaign and, and had time to sort of figure out what we would need. We did request a lot of stuff, but a lot of stuff had to be just use what you've already got because there's a ton of like icons and things like that that are currently not being used for anything. You can just sort through that pile. And in fact, I think it was Tim Campbell who added in a bunch of icons at the last minute from old ones that were not going to be used, but we just threw them into the editor so that we would have something to work with. In terms of restrictions, it was pretty strict. Only major set pieces and things for the major campaign elements could be requested after a certain point. Voice acting was actually much easier to get things from because they were coming in for a session so we could just tack on some additional lines and that's why there's a lot of unused lines actually uh, throughout the game because we would over request things if we didn't need it at the end of the day it was no big deal we just leave it on the the back burner for potentially a future user map question number seven do you think that land should be a part of every game that's land area network. Let's be honest, if someone wants to pirate something, it will be pirated, but at the same time, the less constraints there are, the more people can be converted to players and there are less problems, etc. I think land should be supported for every game. I uh, always enjoyed uh, bringing my computer over to someone's house and doing our own private LAN parties and things like that. I don't think there's any reason to exclude it. Honestly, if people are going to pirate the, your game, they're going to do whatever it takes to pirate your game, and there's no real sense in trying to stop that. There are far more benefits than there are drawbacks to having LAN be accessible. Question number eight. What do you think about certain mechanics in RTS games, such as trampling cavalry in BFME games or inaccurate ranged units in Age of Mythology? Would you add such things to Warcraft 3 and what other mechanics have been considered during the development? It has day night cycle and corpse utilization for instance considered a few things that we saw in other games but ultimately they weren't right for us such as there was a unit in i think it was battle realms that had a glass sword upgrade <laughs> but then when you use the glass sword it would break it would kill a unit instantly but then they didn't have a sword anymore <laughs> which i thought was a little bit silly i would think it would go back to a normal sword or something trampling cavalry you no know, those sorts of things that have to work well with pathing tend to be very dangerous to add. And at that point in development, we just weren't gonna do something like that. I think the biggest mechanic that we sort of didn't do was to have buildable ships by the player. We didn't really support water as a main mechanic in any of the maps. Maybe there was a missed opportunity there, but there was also the problem of it clashing with the hero and the hero dying in a boat and then sinking to the bottom of the ocean or something. A little bit too much in terms of um, veer off in the direction that the game was going, which was big battles on land with the hero involved. Maybe we could have made it work, but we didn't put in the time and effort. Question number <clears throat> nine. What parts of Stranger's Wrath did you work on? What was Lauren Lanning like to work with? Lauren Lanning said his game got screwed over and released early by EA. Did you see any of this and can you elaborate? Oh boy, can I ever. Uh, first, let's talk about the fun stuff. So the sections that I worked on were the Luton Duke. Uh, which is one of the early ones that you meet. Uh, I was just cleaning it up. It wasn't my concept. Elbows Freely was entirely my concept, not art, uh, but you know, I give some direction on that. And Fatty McBoom Boom was uh, also entirely my boss fight. I did all the interactions and scripts uh, in Buzzerton City, which were copied and used in all the other cities. I handled the forest sniper run, uh, which is the beginning of region three before you get to the town. Uh, that's where you're in the forest and they're trying to shoot you. <laughs> Region 1 section after the town and up to the three cutters at a rope climb. In Town 1, the jail cell interactions between outlaws and the jailer. So whenever you went into the jail, you'd hear all the people you'd captured uh, talking to each other. That was me, I, and I wrote that as well. The sniper enemy gameplay behaviors and the defeat scripts. So you'll note if you play Outer World Strangers of Wrath, if you fire a charged up shot at the sniper, it's an instant kill every time. And that was on purpose. It's actually scripted that way. So the enemy snipers 
will always miss their first shot by just a little bit to give you a warning that they're in the area that got copied across the game. So a pretty successful little script and also a bunch of dialogue to support all the townsfolk and the levels and the quests and the comedy. So that was sort of my major foray, foray into writing uh, direct dialogue and getting that into the game. I had a very fun time working on Strangers of Wrath. Lauren Lanning, what was he like to work with? Um, so when Lauren Lanning would play your level, it would look basically like this. And he'd be, this is what you would hear. And he would look at it in, intently. And then when he was done, he would hand you the controller back and it would be hot. Like steam would be coming off of it. It was crazy. So he, he played the game very, very intensely. He would give you very good feedback. Honestly, his feedback was some of the best I've received in terms of um, design direction or user experience direction. He was very helpful in that regard. Now, on the other hand, <laughs> he was not very good at uh, base design, base game design. He didn't have a good grasp of what made for good gameplay systems and mechanics. He relied on randomness a lot, and that's why there was such a shift from like Abe's Odyssey and, and those games to Oddworld Stranger's Wrath, which Eric Yo, who of Command & Conquer fame, I believe, was the lead designer for Oddworld Stranger's Wrath and probably one of the best people that I've ever worked with in terms of he was very open to ideas and very encouraging and gave very good uh, feedback on game design and had a lot of good ways to improve on your, your design. I actually learned quite a lot at, at uh, Oddworld from him and in terms of user experience from Lauren Lanning too. So that was a very good experience for me. Now, as to <clears throat> getting screwed by EA, oh boy. <laughs> As Stranger's Wrath sort of was wrapping up, we needed a publisher. Lauren Lanning was shopping around trying to find one, and unfortunately back then there weren't a whole lot of choices. One of those choices was EA, and what EA did was they came to the studio in San Luis Obispo and they pitched to him saying that now this time would be different, we're very much more open, and blah 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 blah. They did a whole song and dance to get our game. Lauren was hesitant, but eventually relented because we didn't have a better option. There were no TV spots or anything like that. There was no real marketing push. We were relegated to two two-page ads in a couple of artsy-focused game magazines. As a result of that, sales were poor. When Lauren Lanning went to EA and was like, what the fuck? They pushed back with, we don't know how to market your game. At which point, my next question would have been, if that's not your entire purpose, I don't know what it is. So FEA, in every single way. Question number 10. Speaking of Dota, what was your first impression of the original game? And do you know why Blizzard didn't capitalize on the idea? I thought it was a cool little user-made map. We liked it so much that I believe we included a version of it on the Frozen Throne disc, or maybe we released it after. I think maybe the triggers were too tough and we had to refine them further. I can't remember exactly. So in terms of Blizzard not capitalizing on the idea, uh, we felt that we were because that user-made map spurred more sales of Warcraft 3. People were buying Warcraft 3 just to play the Dota user map. And that was kind of the whole point <laughs> of uh, the user map stuff. We never thought about making our own version of Dota or trying to monetize Dota in any way because that's just not the kind of company that Blizzard was. But other people did and they went off and formed their own studios and you know, more power to them. League of Legends and Riot Games have made some of the best you know, entertainment that I've seen in a while. Arcane is my number one show right now. I see that as a holistic way for new companies to form, is to take these sort of ideas and run with them. And I'm glad that Blizzard didn't like put their foot down and try to control Dota. And I wonder if that might have been a different tale had uh, Activision had more of their hooks into it and Mike Morheim had left earlier. 